All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for this Native Nations and Climate Change webinar series. My name is Larry Perez with the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program, and I really want to welcome you to this particular edition, which is going to focus squarely on how to navigate all the services and support available through the USGS Climate Adaptation Science centers. Right off the bat, I want you to know that today's broadcast is being live captioned through the kind assistance of Fed Relay. And if you'd like to take advantage of that service, please just go ahead and use the link that I'm posting in the chat box now for live captioning. Also, I want to make you aware that today's broadcast is being recorded for possible future sharing online down the line. With that, uh, just a couple notes about the technology that we're going to be using today. For those of you that may not be too familiar with GoToWebinar, all the functionality of the webinar platform is available through this menu that is found on your desktop right now. If the panels for the webinar interface are not already open, you can use the button at the very top to fly out that series of panels so that all your available tools are visible. Uh, there's a chance that your panels are set to auto hide after a set period of time so for ease of use you may want to click on view on top in your menu bar and make sure the auto hide the control panel feature is deselected that'll leave your panels open for the duration of today's event and that may be important you're going to have an opportunity today to meet and interact with four esteemed panelists that we've invited for today's webinar and you'll have two different modalities through which to ask questions along the way at any point in time during today's webinar, you can enter questions into the questions panel. Uh, I'll be monitoring uh, input into that panel and sharing those questions with our presenters as opportunities arise. In addition, we're also going to reserve a bit of time at the end of today's webinar after the presentations for an open Q&A session. During that session, you'll be more than welcome to use the raise your hand button within the webinar interface. And currently, because everyone, we have a lot of folks attending today's seminar, uh, everyone is by default on mute just to minimize background noise, but when we get into that question and answer session, you can raise your hand indicating you want to voice a question or bring your voice into the room, and we'll be able to unmute you one by one to be able to do that. So know that you'll have a couple different ways to ask questions and interact with our panelists as the event goes on. So with that, and without further ado, I just want to introduce our host for today's webinar, Ms. Pam Benjamin. Pam is the Cooperative Conservation and Climate Change Coordinator for the National Park Service Intermountain Regional Office, and she's based in Lakewood, Colorado. Pam is a vegetation ecologist by training and has served in multiple resource management positions uh, in National Park Service sites and at the regional office. Pam's current focus is to assist Intermountain Parks with natural and cultural resource technical assistance needs related to climate change impacts and response, and to represent Intermountain Regional Parks with larger landscape conservation partnerships. Pam, thanks very much for your leadership in organizing this series, and I kick it off to you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Larry. And I want to say good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're located. And I also want to welcome you to the first of the three webinars focused on Native Nations and uh, engagement with climate change. And as Larry has identified, our webinar today is titled Navigating the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, a National Network of Climate Adaptation Support for Native Nations. Before I introduce our four presenters, I, I do want to give you a heads up on the next two webinars. Our second webinar will be held on Wednesday, May 28th at the same time. It is titled Words Matter Considering Language Barriers. And this presentation will specifically focus on terminology differences related to climate change and those differences that exist between Western science and our uh, Native nations or indigenous community. Then our third webinar will be held on Wednesday, June 30th, and that will feature Dorothy Firecloud, who is the MPS National Native American Affairs Liaison. Uh, she also assists the director in Washington, D.C., and she is going to provide us with an overview of MPS tribal programs and also be able to identify and answer any questions related to the types of activities that our tribal partners can do in parks. So going back to today, uh, let me briefly introduce our four USGS Climate Adaptation Science Center presenters. First up will be Althea Walker, 
Althea is the Tribal Climate Science Liaison for the American Indian Higher Education Consortium at the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. She is a descendant of the Nez Perce, Hopi, and Gila River people, and she is enrolled as a member of the Gila River Indian community. Althea serves an important uh, resource to tribal nations and tribal colleges and universities that are within the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center service area, which includes the states of Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah. She provides information, technical assistance, and access to subject matter experts uh, necessary to support local climate resilience research, planning, and implementation efforts. The second presenter will be Stefan Tangen. Stefan serves as a tribal resilience liaison for the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. He works to support resilience building and climate adaptation with Native nations and indigenous communities. His primary focus is capacity building throughout uh, uh, with Native nations and climate adaptation, I should say, with Native nations and indigenous communities. Who, uh, and this capacity building is, is really in an area that is uh, incredibly underserved within the U.S. He does this through training and educational workshops, project development, and direct partnerships with tribal resource managers, tribal councils, and tribal colleges. Our third presenter is April Taylor. April is a tribal liaison with the Chickasaw Nation office at the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Her position includes facilitating relationships between tribes and climate scientists within the states of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. April is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, and I happen to know that she has a very strong interest in research related to climate change impacts to culturally significant plant species. And then finally, our fourth presenter will be Dr. Casey Thornburg. He is a member of the United South and Eastern Tribes Incorporated, or USET. He serves as a liaison between tribes in the Northeast and the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers. He works closely with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and to provide current climate science information to identify climate research needs and priorities and to provide climate adaptation planning support to tribes. Casey is a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and he has an educational background in climate science. So with that, I shall stop speaking, and then we'll let Larry turn the webinar over to Althea. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Althea Walker. And uh, thank you for joining us today, myself and the other three liaisons, um, in which we will be presenting on navigating the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, a national network of climate adaptation support for Native nations. So the outline for today, um, we'll be doing some introductions of ourselves real quickly in this next slide, and then um, I will be covering the introduction to the CASC or the Climate Adaptation Science Center Network. So if we say CASC, that's what we're talking about um, and our roles as liaison. Stefan will be covering ethics and relationships. April will be covering context and cultural heritage. And Casey will be um, closing us out with some example case studies. Um, and we will have some time for Q&A um, at the end of the presentations and a conclusion from the National Park Service. So uh, again, thank you all um, who have joined us today. Um, again, there's time for Q&A at the end. Um, and again, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Um, but just to put faces with names, if you didn't see our faces up um, during the initial introduction, but I'm Althea Walker. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Chandler, Arizona, the homelands of the um, Otham and Peeposh here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, and I'll let Stefan, April, and Casey say hello. Hi, yeah, my name is Stefan Tangen. I work directly for the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance. I'm calling in from just outside of Denver, Colorado, the lands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne peoples. Hi, 
Hi, I'm April Taylor. I am a Chickasaw member and I'm calling in from Norman, Oklahoma, and I work with the tribes in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. Hello, Anikasat. I'm Natasha with Casey Thornbrook on the Thomas Mississippi. Um, hello, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Thornbrook. I'm a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. I'm calling in from uh, my home in Mashpee, um, and I uh, work remotely with I uh, work for United South and Eastern Tribes and with the Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so to get us started, um, you know, I just wanted to provide some overview of this unique partnership that we have between the BIA Tribal Resilience Program, um, a number of tribal organizations across the nations, and um, the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Centers across the nation. So um, there are eight of us tribal resilience liaisons. Seven of us are funded by the BIA Tribal Resilience Program. Um, the eighth liaison, which is April Taylor, um, who is a presenter today, she is employed by the Chickasaw Nation. Um, and then uh, we are all hosted by a tribal organization who employs us, manages us, um, and then we are all uh, we all have an office location at one of the climate adaptation science centers across um, the nation. So to explain um, the BIA tribal resilience program as one of the partners, um, this program was established to build capacity and resilience of federally recognized tribal nations and Alaska Native villages um, through both technical and financial assistance um, and providing uh, data and tools, access to training and workshops and the facilitation of planning for climate adaptation and ocean and coastal management. So for us as uh, tribal resilience liaisons, our role is to serve as climate extension agents for tribal nations and Alaska Native villages across the nation um, and working with them to best access and utilize information, uh, climate information, data, and expertise that is available to us um, at the Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Um, we assist in facilitating research and collaboration, the coordination of forums and information exchange, and supporting tribal proposals for um, the BIA Tribal Resilience funding that comes out every year. Um, in this picture here is Stefan Casey and I at the National Adaptation Forum, I believe, in 2018. Uh, so for the tribal organization, um, an explanation of this partnership or being, them being a partner and who employ and manage us as liaisons, um, the tribal organizations across the nation, so um, the Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association um, employs our Alaska liaison Melinda Chase, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians hosts our Northwest liaison Chaz Jones, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium hosts myself, the Southwest Liaison, the College of Menominee Nation Sustainable Development Institute um, hosts our Midwest Liaison, Sarah Smith, the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance hosts Stephen Tangen from the North Central, and the United South and Eastern Tribes hosts Casey Thornbrew up in the Northeast and Southeast, and then again, the Chickasaw Nation um, hosts April Taylor, um, in the South Central, but not only um, do they employ her and manage her as an employee, but they are also a consortium member of the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. And then for the Climate Adaptation Science Centers who provide us office locations and um, you know easy access to extensive climate science um, resources, so there are nine regional centers across the nation. Um, this map shows eight, but there's currently um, a Midwest liaison, uh, or a Midwest uh, Climate Adaptation Science Center being formed in the Northeast. Um, but each of these centers are here to provide climate adaptation support to federal, state, tribal, um, regional, and local partners, um, and us as tribal liaisons focus, focusing on our tribal partners um, across the nation. And each of these um, climate adaptation science centers um, have a number of consortium members who um, provide additional support to the centers and access to subject matter experts um, within the region or across the region. So, for example, here in the Southwest, the University of Arizona hosts us, and we have partners um, like the Desert Research Institute in Nevada, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in California, 
um, and Utah State University in Utah, um, but there are also a number of consortium members um, within our region. So just an example um, in that each region has um, consortium members. So I'm gonna hand it over to um, Stefan, who will be talking about ethics and relationships, you know, sharing uh, some of the principles that we work by, the experiences that we've had as, as liaisons um, in the work that we do. Um, and just a disclaimer that, um, you know, especially for the audience who is non-National Park Service, that we are not uh, National Park Service tribal liaisons. Um, we're here as partners and to share our experience um, with everybody. So, Stefan. Thanks, Althea. Um, my name is Stefan Tangen. Um, I work for the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance, and I work in association with the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. So, a big land base in the middle of the country. And I just want to say I'm not a tribal member. I'm not, I don't have any indigenous connection. My family are actually Norwegian immigrants, but I grew up in the Pacific Northwest on the lands of Snohomish people. Um, but I've worked with local and indigenous communities for over 10 years uh, all over the world, in Samoa, the Philippines, Sierra Leone, Alaska, and so now in the North Central region. And I'm not an expert, I wouldn't say, on these things, but uh, lots of insights from my 10 years of experience working with the communities that I wanted to share with you all. Um, and I want to just uh, thank Althea again for that introduction. Um, I think it's helpful to have an idea about the CASCs and what we as liaisons do. You know, we connect science. Um, we seek to build capacity with tribal resource managers and help them address climate change impacts. Um, it's a pretty broad uh, scope of work that we have, but unique within the CASC network in large part because of the three priority uh, partners that the CASCs have to serve, which are the state fish and wildlife agencies, Department of Interior agencies, and federally recognized tribes. Only federally recognized tribes have a position like us and liaisons to serve them. So that's a neat um, role that we play. So just looking at my first slide, it's called ethical considerations. The first line item says indigenous communities maintain ties to the land since time immemorial. So just talking about like why um, a manager or a federal agency would want to partner with tribal community. Um, there's lots of reasons, one of them being that um, most folks are aware of colonial history and that there's a lot of myths associated with um, um, the colonization of the United States, one being that colonizers came across in unpeopled lands or wilderness untouched by the human hand. Uh, we know this is not true. We know that indigenous people have been calling this land home for centuries and that uh, indigenous peoples have complex and intricate relationships to the land, the water, and the more than human beings. So it's really important to recognize that depth and breadth of this history and these relationships. Second on my slide, it says UNDRIP, free prior informed consent. A lot of federal agencies uh, do consultation. They throw this word consultation around a lot, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different administrations. Um, big contrast between the previous and the current one. And I think it's helpful to look at the international definition of this. Um, one of the main concepts that comes through in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is free prior and informed consent. Basically means indigenous communities um, they have the right to say no, and they have the right to be informed of a project well before it starts, um, and that's related to any project partnership, legislative or administrative measure that might impact them. Um, consultation is not a check the box exercise, it's a relationship. Uh, last on my slide, indigenous peoples have knowledge that's critical to management. Um, so keeping in mind that uh, Native nations have every right to say no to a project. There are many reasons why they should be prioritized in management. And I've, I've mentioned the history and the connection to the land. Um, but due to this history and this connection, many Native nations have knowledge that's critical to management and really would help reverse some of the mismanagement that's occurred under um, previous federal policy. So looking at my next slide, it says importance of prioritizing Native partnerships. So some examples of, of why this is important, one being that uh, indigenous peoples have been managing the landscape for centuries. Good examples of this are related to uh, cultural burning. Uh, numerous tribes have managed the landscape with fire. Karuk are a really notable example, Potawatomi also, and many others. And we know they've done this through, uh, for many different purposes, creating habitat for uh, animals, for food, for trails. Frank Lake actually gave a great presentation at the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center hosted yesterday 
uh, going into really great detail on this topic. Second, uh, again, just indigenous land stewardship created the ecosystem services that attracted the settlers. So debunking this myth of unpeopled Americas, um, people came across landscape when they colonized this country to um, a really comfortable, enjoyable landscape that was attractive. And that's largely because of indigenous land, land management. One of those uh, management regimes was the Menominee. And that's my last point on this slide. The Menominee recognized as a world leader in indigenous and sustainable forest management. Um, our Midwest liaison works directly for the College of Menominee. And this is a great example because it shows that using sustainable methods informed by indigenous management um, has created some of the most robust and sustainable forests in the world. Um, they've been harvesting commercial timber for 150 years creating half a billion board feet and is some of the healthiest forests in the world as well. So looking at my next slide, I just wanna um, reiterate kind of what a partnership with a native nation might look like. So it's, it's very much relationship centered. So we're creating relationships with folks based on wanting to work with them, not based on a project timeline, um, not based on a check the box exercise. Uh, it's definitely not transactional and it very much is reciprocal and personal. And there are many ways to go about doing that, but ensuring that um, that you're in it for the right reasons is, is, is central to that relationship. And just my last slide um, before I pass it on to April. I, I recommend, you know, do the work. There's lots of resources out there. Coming to this uh, presentation today is, is definitely a great uh, step in that process. Um, so one thing is the, that many Native nations and regional organizations, they have protocols specifically for partnering on research. Um, when I did my master's program in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, I worked at the community of Shack Tulik and used the uh, Alaska Federation of Natives protocol to guide my process in doing work with them. There's also robust literature out there. Um, some really great authors to check out, Dr. Kyle Powis white has tons of literature. Um, Sean Wilson has a book called Research is Ceremony. There's a New Zealander named Linda Tuiwa Smith has a great book called Decolonizing Methodologies. And if you've never seen this website before, it could be really helpful. It's called nativeland.ca and shows um, what land you may be living or, or working on that was traditionally a um, belong to a native nation. Uh, lastly, understand the context. So depending on what uh, Native Nation you're working with, it's helpful to understand what that history, kind of what they deal with on a regular basis. I work throughout the North Central region in the Missouri River Basin. And so the systems of dams that exist on the Missouri River are really helpful for me to understand better. There's a book called Damned Indians that I've been using to kind of further uh, inform my understanding of the way in which many tribal lands were flooded out and their cultural uh, resources flooded, their burial sites flooded and, and where they lived for since time immemorial flooded out. So um, ultimately it's about listening, uh, being open and, and willing to learn. So uh, I'm gonna pass it on to April. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some context of working with tribes and cultural resources and climate change and one of the first things that I wanted to talk about, and I know the next webinar is really going to be talking about language and, and that words matter, but here's a few um, that I wanted to introduce today. Um, so cultural heritage is the legacy of physical artifacts and intangible attributes of a group or society that is inherited from past generations. Um, not all legacies of past generations are heritage, rather heritage is a product of selection by society. Um, so cultural heritage is um, much broader. Um, it um, is often talked about in the international um, context of many um, indigenous groups and um, at a global scale. Um, here in the US, um, we use a lot of of the cultural resources language, um, which cultural resources are tangible and the intangible. They're spiritual, secular, natural, created, and age and range from ancient times to even the present. Um, 
cultural resources are valued and interpreted in accordance with societal or and individual or personal worldviews and histories. Um, and I just want to say that um, cultural resources is a term um, that's not defined legally, um, that it's not defined in the National um, Environmental Policy Act or any other federal law. Um, and it's intentionally not defined because it is, um, you know, specific to every tribe and um, each of them have their own cultural resources. Um, so in contemporary use of the term in federal and state local government environmental compliance is narrower than our definition and generally remains um, in undefined and will probably stay that way. Um, as far as um, traditional ecological knowledge, um, Peter Usher refers to it as uh, specifically to all types of knowledge about environment that derive from the experience or traditions of a particular group of people. Um, so that's another key term to be familiar with. And then preservation is really key um, as well. And it um, is a means of keeping cultural and heritage from a present uh, for the future. And it's often in reference to a current or a reference condition. Um, and so when we think about climate change, uh, preservation may not be realistic um, of trying to maintain or preserve something to a current state or a historic state. Um, so with that, uh, next slide, please. So next, I wanted to give some context um, of Native nations. Um, so here um, in the US, we have, um, since 1992, we have had the amendments uh, to the National Historic Preservation Act where uh, American tribes could take over preservation functions. Um, and in 1996, uh, there were only 12 tribes uh, that formally uh, had some kind of historic preservation authority and responsibility. And then by 2017, uh, more than 170 tribes um, were participating and um, may have had a tribal historic preservation officer, or as we refer to as TIPOs. Um, so, you know, the capacity of some of these programs um, fall under, um, you know, may have a tribal historic preservation officer and or may not, you know, there's still tribes today that um, don't have this kind of capacity or um, have taken on that responsibility. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is even though um, the National Historic Preservation Act um, started considering sovereignty and self-determination, um, the, you know, the, the practice of that it still falls under that Western value system that the National Historic Preservation Act um, started with. And so they, they operate under that. Um, another um, key thing to know is that, um, that under the system, um, tribal cultural properties or TCPs um, became um, a new designation under the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and so tribes were able to include their value systems to um, designate their properties under that. Um, where in reality, um, a lot of these places that the tribal uh, cultural properties, DCPs, were already on the registered, um, but they had just added um, other aspects. And so some of those aspects that they included um, were their um, you know, their association with their cultural practices or their beliefs or the living community that um, that were rooted in that, uh, the history there. And so they they continue to associate those places with their um, continuing their cultural identity um, today. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so these tribal historic preservation offices or cultural resources offices, they primarily focus on um, those historic uh, properties and structures. Um, they do a lot of grave protection, um, NACRA, um, and so they um, 
and they really get bogged down with them uh, reacting to NACRA. Um, they also have cemetery crews um, that go out and clean and maintain uh, their cemeteries. Um, they're doing language revitalization, revitalization and, um, and do a lot of language um, education. Uh, they also are really focused on revitalizing their culture and so bringing back a lot of things that um, may not have been practiced or back into their life ways and places. Um, and then they also deal with um, access to federal properties as well. Um, so many of the federal properties, um, tribes have access to gather or to do um, cultural practices and ceremonies and things there. Um, so maintaining that access and, and things. They also, um, most of the tribal consultation um, goes through the cultural resources department. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind if you're um, looking for tribal consultation or listening sessions and things that, um, that it may not be going to the right departments if you're working on um, natural resources, for example, or something else. Um, so um, I just wanted to um, say recently Chickasaw Nation um, repatriated about 400 of our peoples. And so this has been a big thing for us and it happens. It just takes a long time and, and there's a process to that. And so it's really a big thing for us and our tribes and, and a huge win for us. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are all sorts of opportunities to engage with tribes um, in these uh, in these departments. Um, so things like interpretation and education at the national parks, um, uh, including the tribal perspective or um, in, in being educated in the, in the history and, and what those sites mean. Um, cultural management plans for the parks or, or sites, um, burn plans. So Stefan mentioned some of the burn, uh, cultural burning and practices. Um, so considering um, including the tribes in your burn plans. And of course, uh, since we're here today to talk about climate change, uh, we would encourage you to um, include tribes and in your any climate related projects as well. So uh, next slide. Um, things to keep in mind, though, is that uh, the values of the Native nations are often very different than the Western perspective. Um, so things like, you know, a sense of feeling and interconnectedness to a location or a site. Um, there are, you know, many of these sites, you know, they're liver, living aspects of our tribal culture, um, their connection to our ancestors, and everything has a spiritual um, aspect to them and everything has spirit even the ants or the rocks the, the sticks everything is meant to stay in its place and and isn't um, supposed to you know be taken and so um, so that's something to keep in mind these many of these places are used for ceremonies and prayer um, as well um, so part of that culture and that spirit um, Keep in mind that tribes think of things holistically and not uh, separate out things. So um, if you're working under um, a federal agency or a law that treats um, cultural resources separate, um, tribes don't think of them you know, as separate. Natural and cultural resources are one of the same um, and you know, they are very important uh, to tribal culture. And so, um, even though you and your Western perspective may approach NEPA or the National Historic Preservation very separately, um, they don't consider those things as separate. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that um, there's a lot of things that are not supposed to be shared and um, data sovereignty principles as well that are considered. And so um, there's a lot of things in tribal culture, such as um, timing of when things are shared, uh, whether it's a song or a story, um, it may be seasonal or it may be um, other things that um, there's a timing or a meaning of when that is shared. 
Um, and there may be only specific people within that tribe that can share that or know that knowledge. Um, and not everybody in the tribe um, has that knowledge. Um, so it's really a key to um, respect that and be um, aware of that. Um, that's if something's shared with you, um, you know, it's shared with you and not with your agency or, um, and it may not be, they don't may not want it shared um, beyond that. So, um, so things to keep in mind and in their value systems and how these things are valued. Um, next slide, please. So losing cultural heritage is, is very different um, in the sense of tribes and what it means to them, um, and especially as climate change impacts these things. Uh, it's our connection to our ancestors and our spiritual connection. It's um, a connection to social and cultural traditions, whether that's historic or current day um, traditions. It's also and, um, an economic value and tourism visits and things like that. It's also understanding how we adapted in the past and might adapt in the future. So understanding um, traditionally how those things and how things were decided and why they happened. Um, and often, you know, is huge learning for, um, for our futures. And a lot of our language is embedded in these places. You know, our, play, our languages were based off of where we lived and the things around us and, and places. And so maintaining that language and, and understanding that language um, is based off of that place. Um, and so language is huge for um, you know, maintaining our cultural identities. Um, and then also cultural landscapes and ways of life, you know, these it's much broader than just that site it's it's within the cultural landscape and, and um, as well and so much broader and holistic so next slide so what it really means is a losing our identity and our um, the differences between um, tribes across the landscape um, and over time and who we are and that connection to that is really what it comes down to. And so keep all these things in mind when you're working with tribes on cultural resources or on cultural resources and climate change um, as you um, or when you're reaching out to them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Casey and he's going to give us some examples of what good tribal relationships look like. All right. Thank you, April. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be segueing into a, a couple case studies here, but in doing so, um, one of the things uh, I think about in terms of relationships and engagement with tribal nations is, uh, is geography. Um, I, uh, as was stated earlier, I have a background in uh, climate science, but it's through a geography department. Um, it's, uh, my PhD is in geography. And, uh, you know, some of the things that I've found, or one of the things I found to be true is that becoming familiar with indigenous um, geographies and geographies of tribal nations requires relearning K through 12 geography. Um, and, you know, especially in the United States. Um, earlier we saw maps, uh, a map of the climate adaptation science centers. And I work, as I said, closely with the Northeast and the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Um, you can see on this slide here on the left is the map of the Northeast uh, CASC, um, which is going to be updated um, now that there's the Midwest CASC and the Northeast CASC. But um, one of the things is, you know, when you look at a map, you kind of see what's there. And um, in the context, especially, you know, across the, North America, this is true to an extent, but we also work with it in the East and it's um, visibility. Uh, and when I first uh, started working with the Northeast CASC, um, you know, it was mentioned that it's a very large region and consisting of 22 states and they can be seen on this map. Um, in the same space, uh, there are 60 federally, uh, six zero uh, federally recognized 
uh, tribal nations. Um, and uh, being employed by uh, an inter-tribal uh, uh, nonprofit, United South and Eastern Tribes, we as employees were, of course, expected to know um, where the tribal nations that we provide technical support and services are. Um, and But uh, in working with the Climate Adaptation Science Center, some of the work um, I've been trying to do in working with the center staff and leadership to do is to expand that. Um, so as Stefan mentioned earlier, um, you know, there is a resource um, called the Native Lands um, Map, and it's shown here an example snapshot of it on the uh, right. Um, I considered a, a good starting point. Um, there, you know, have those, been those that have been working on this map and constantly updating it um, to show the uh, homelands of, of tribal nations. Uh, that said, it is a very important to also go further and to um, really look at, you know, tribal nations, communities, and your um, immediate geography for which you work and live. Um, I guess geographers would call that ground truthing. You know, just you know, you you have the map, but you also have to take it a further take it uh, further in contact. Uh, next slide, please. So. One of the things I do appreciate about the um, uh, Native Lands map is it shows that um, you know all of uh, North America, Central America, and South America um, are the homelands of tribal nations, sovereign tribal nations. Um, tribal nation spaces are connections and relationships with the lands and waters of these spaces. Um, Territories may exist, but they may not be with hard boundaries and often shared spaces. Um, tribal nation spaces exist through relationships, um, including trade, kinship networks, and internation alliances. Uh, for example, like the Haudenosaunee, um, also known as the Six Nations, an alliance of nations that you know share a similar, uh, the same language family, but also made a, a governmental and sovereign decision to, to stay connected um, as independent uh, tribal nations, but also as a collective six nations. Um, and that's, you know, we see that there's um, across the world, um, you have uh, the United Nations, you have, uh, you know, many, many examples of that. Wabanoaki, a uh, collection of, uh, connection of tribal nations um, in the space of, say like the area of the state of Maine or Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Um, there's movement over spaces, uh, joining alliances, um, environmental changes, uh, movement to avoid threats or forced removal from lands, um, but nevertheless, constant relationships uh, with homelands. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things I've been working, uh, for example, with the uh, the Northeast Cask is um, on our tribal partners page, um, working to develop um, a, you know a map uh, showing location of uh, tribal nations. Um, this is uh, in, in draft stage, as you can kind of see. Um, but as I had mentioned, there are 60 federally recognized tribal nations in um, the Northeast, or now the, the Midwest and Northeast cast space. Um, what's true is that when you look at, um, for example, acreage and things like that uh, for trust lands or um, reservation spaces, um, they're not uh, often not large enough to be ascertained from a uh, a U.S. or regional scale. Um, so, you know, we've got these these points here that are labeled, um, and each one showing, um, you know, the, the tribal nation's uh, headquarters or community uh, uh, place. So, but this is really just a start because we have to think of um, another thing. And if we go to the next slide, please. You know, when, when you looked at that map, and I've had people look at it and say, you know, um, well, there aren't tribal nations in, in this space. And in fact, I was at a meeting and I had um, someone from uh, uh, Ohio, uh, for example, and they said, well, we don't have 
um, tribes in, in Ohio. And um, I was explaining to them that uh, at present, it's, it's true that there isn't um, a federally recognized tribal nation in the, the state boundaries, if you will, but um, it's still tribal homelands and there are uh, tribal nations today that have um, connections to that space. And so um, just important to mention also tribal nations, this is also tribal nation spaces, even though you might not see trust lands or federal um, reservation lands. Um, many tribal nations in this area um, were forced to places out west, such as Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, or even some also uh, uh, their nations went into areas in Canada. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, it's also important to consider um, in your geograph in the geographic space that you live and work, um, there may be non-federally recognized tribal nations. Um, this is especially true in the East. Um, the burden is on tribal nations to prove continuity uh, through and despite the impacts of colonization um, and proving this to the um, U.S. government. Um, just as, as an example of my own tribal nation, Mashi Wampanoag tribe, um, we know we're, we're older than 10,000 years. We saw the, the glaciers recede. Um, we signed a treaty along with other um, eight other um, Wampanoag uh, nations um, with English colonists in 1621, following the American Revolution and, and subsequent Wars. Um, in 1975, we put in our petition for federal recognition, and it was about a 30-year process. Uh, many tribal nations may not have treaties with the United States because it was not the United States yet. Um, and so um, just kind of being aware, again, of, of that. Um, some tribal nations and communities are recognized by state governments. Um, so the point in all this is it's very important to learn local geography. Um, you, the fairly recognized tribal nations in the region you live and work or does the state you live in or work in have, for example, commission or office on Indian or Native American affairs? Next slide, please. Um, again, I kind of go back to the K-12 uh, thing because some of the curriculum that I as a child in the 1980s saw is what um, K-12 through students, uh, including Native American students, see in their textbooks today. And so this, um, well, you know, one of the things we try to advocate to avoid is teaching or learning um, of tribal nations as groups or in the past tense, uh, using past tense language. So this, uh, you know, a little snapshot from, from Facebook here, but this is uh, uh, an assignment for elementary school kid. And it says, what are the three major regions in which Native Americans lived, past tense? And this student is a citizen of tribal nation, Native American, and they very mindfully wrote, we still live here. So, um, uh, you know, uh, glad that they were, they and their family um, responded to that. Um, also being mindful that uh, perspective of indigenous um, peoples as visitors or guests to park spaces can be offensive because it's like, if you're, you're being referred to as a guest, um, or a visitor to a space that you're ancestrally tied to, or in some cases, you can even trace your family to that exact space. Um, so kind of thinking about those and acknowledging uh, indigenous peoples and tribal nations as original stewards of the spaces. And even if these spaces may have parks on them uh, today. Next slide, please. So it's important to acknowledge tribal nations as governments with agencies um, and responsible for the services of, of their citizens, um, including the infrastructure, public safety, land and water stewardship, et cetera. That's another thing um, as we've gone on to try to continue um, to um, reinforce, if you will, um, whether a tribal nation has 500 citizens, 10,000 or 100,000, um, it's a sovereign, sovereign government and um, uh, you know, as I tell people, um, I worked for my own tribal nation and um, I look at tribal council as Congress, like yeah, just, just as, as it would be important if you were to give a testimony or report to the United States Congress, it's that important for, for me and for others, you know, if we are 
presenting or being in the presence of our tribal government, tribal council. Um, and tribal nations have agencies. So just like there's the National Park Service um, as an agency to unite in the United States, a tribal nation may have a culture and heritage agency. It might be called the department, it might be called something else, but it should be respected as, as such. Next slide, please. Hey, Casey, just busted yep. in here for a second. This is Larry, just conscious of time. We're running a little short and have a couple questions to address. So uh, just make it through these last couple of slides pretty quick if you can. No problem. So we'll go ahead and wrap up um, through those. So um, with tribal engagement, it's important to attend and become uh, involved in tribal events, but being mindful that these are events open to partners um, or, um, or they're at invitation and kind of mindfully participating in these events by asking yourself, is, partici is participation appropriate to the topic of the context of the meeting? Um, and respecting time um, and availability. Um, next slide, please. So for example, in the Southeast CAS, uh, we are now working with the Seminole Tribe of Florida Heritage and Environmental Resource Office. The acronym is HERO, and they are agency of the tribal government of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, what's important about this relationship is that this is a relationship that started with an invitation, an invitation by the uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida um, hero. And um, it has developed over a couple of years. Uh, the invitation came at uh, a um, USAID meeting. Um, I presented on my work as tribal climate science liaison and I was asked by a representative of HERO to see if I could connect them with the Southeast CASC and if we could arrange a site visit um, to the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And that's what's pictured here is, is our site visit. Site visits are very important. It's very important to take the care um, that you are a guest and that um, the Tribal Nation employees, staff, and citizens have kind of stopped what they're doing to um, work with you and to show you around. And so, um, we have to make sure we follow through and um, provide those the information and technical support services. So um, that's also very important. Next slide. And I think this is my last one. Uh, going back to the Northeast, um, another uh, strategy is connecting the Northeast cast with uh, scholars and those who have been working closely with tribal nations who may be um, from tribal nations uh, this picture shows um, uh, our forest adaptation technical assistant, uh, Tyler Everett, who's a citizen of the Roosted Band of Micmacs, who works with several tribal nations in forestry. Uh, Dr. Kelsey Leonard, citizen of the Shinnecock Indian Nation, who works with many tribal nations on the mid-Atlantic coast. So trying to connect people to people to ensure that we can get information and resources um, to assist tribal nations with climate change adaptation. Um, I'll stop there and say katap tano. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much, Casey. Appreciate that. I'm going to light up everyone's cameras on the panel and uh, invite a bit of Q&A here. We have fantastic presentations, panelists. Really appreciate the time uh, and thoughtfulness in each, and they've generated a number of questions within the questions panel. Attendees, you're welcome to submit some more or raise your hand. Uh, and I can unmute you, but in the interim, um, Casey, I think this was really kind of directed at you towards your presentation. Um, are there are there links to the Tribal Nations data layers that you shared available for ArcGIS? And if so, are those available for the use of others? Um, so there might be, there are, there are probably some, you have to kind of think about those on, um, so there's certainly like the layer to um, federal trust lands and, uh, uh, tribal tribal nation trust lands, um, but uh, other other types of things. Um, if it's specific to tribal nations, you kind of have to um, make sure those are uh, if those are publicly available. You know, you can, you can utilize those. Um, I will say real quick, um, there are some tribal nations that have been developing story maps that they are sharing publicly and and sh sharing that which way they. Uh, you know, are able to share. Um, it's good to visit some of those. Uh, Seneca Nation has a really good one, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida also has a very um, uh, active story map. Excellent. Thanks for that. And and 
Kevin, who was the submitter of that question, I hope that answered your question. If not, I should make known to everybody available uh, through the handouts panel of your webinar interface is a PDF copy of the presentation that our panelists shared with us today. And so you have access to all those hyperlinks that were in there, as well as email addresses for each of the individual panelists. So I encourage you, if there are questions that were not quite answered, <laughs> if I did not paraphrase your question properly, uh, or if you want some more information, I encourage you to reach out to the individual panelists uh, with your questions. Also, if there's anything that we're unable to get to today. I did have an additional question here uh, saying, most of the affiliated tribal nations in our area are not federally recognized. Do they not then have access to any of this support? If someone can address that. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, go ahead, Casey. So um, yeah, at present, uh, Support and funding through the Bureau Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Climate Resilience Program uh, goes to federally recognized uh, tribal nations. So, um, uh, tribal nations that are not federally recognized um, have to, at present, kind of seek other forms of uh, support. Um, and uh, I, I'm aware that you know some, you know, can get you know pretty creative in trying to um, fund some things to address uh, issues in, in your tribal nation community. So I'll just kind of share that. Uh, but through the BI, yeah, we work directly with uh, federally, federally recognized tribal nations. Excellent. I appreciate that. And I, I, I will say there's a lot of other great comments panelists. Look in the questions panel. You're getting lots of love from some of our attendees saying great session. We really appreciate the time and attention you put into the presentations today. I do want to, a number of folks have asked about the upcoming sessions in this ongoing webinar series. We do have one coming up next month, May 26th, and I will share a link to the to register for that particular event in the chat box now. Feel free to register for that as of now, and we will share uh, links to register for the June session uh, next month. We've just not populated those yet. So May is available for registration now. June will be forthcoming. Excellent. We've got two minutes at the top of the hour. Althea, Casey, Stefan, April, I want to again sincerely thank you. Any final words from you and or Pam, who is on with us still as well? So I'll just say, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted a forum here in the Southwest. It was virtual. Um, but uh, there are some words that stuck with me and that, you know, a, a tribal panelist stated that, you know, the project um, is not the center um, of, of us working together, and it's only a part of it. And um, we should think of it as uh, just a relationship building, a long lasting opportunity to build relationship and projects happen throughout that time, but it's not the center of, of what we do. Excellent. All right. On behalf of the entire organizing team, we thank you all very much for attending and hope to see you next month for the next installment of the Native Nations and Climate Change webinar series. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.